Today, we're gonna to continue looking at parameterized curves. We want to be able to describe a one-dimensional curve in R3. And we're starting off by describing one-dimensional curves in R2. And our favorite one to use is the unit circle. So recall that the uh, parameterized curve where X is cosine of T and Y is sine of T for T between zero and two pi will give us a circle of radius one centered at the origin. The extra stuff is remember that when we parameterize a curve, we give that curve a start and an end. And that means we give that curve a direction. So this is not only the circle with radius one centered at the origin, but the way that we've parameterized it, it's starting off at one zero and going once around counterclockwise. So if we break down the, cos the, the x motion and the y motion, we can think about the graphs of those. So x is cosine of t. And so we know that once around, cosine of t will start off at one, drop down to negative one, and then come back up to one. And so we can see x starting off at one, dropping down to negative one, and then coming back up to one. And we know that the graph for y of t, I don't know why I'm making such dinky graphs. Okay. I guess it's just gonna be a small graph day. Well, oh, I, actually now I know why, because I'm drawing sine curve, sines and cosines. You should always draw them before your axis. It's like circles. Always draw the circle first. And then we can see why, um, as we, we start off at one zero, uh, we start off when x is equal to one, it drops down to negative one and then comes back up to one. With the y's, we start off at zero, we go up to one, down to negative one, and then back up to zero. And the combination of those two, um, those two motions, the horizontal and the vertical, give us not only this circle, but this circle starting off at one zero and going once around counterclockwise. The Y started off at the zero, went up, down, and then up again. So if we understand how this motion works, we can start making adjustments and find different circles. So if for example, I keep x at cosine of t, but I change y to be negative sine of t. And let's say this is still for t from zero to two pi. So now I'm keeping the same x, starting off at one, dropping down to negative one, coming back up to one. So we're still gonna start off at this end, go down and then back up again. Well, let's see what happens with sine, the graph of, uh, sorry, with y as negative sine of t. So negative sine of t, instead of going up, down, then up again, negative sine of t, we'll start off going negative. So down, up, down, back to two pi. So instead, we'll start off at one zero because here's one and here's the zero. We're still keeping that zero. We'll start off at one zero, but now instead of go, y going up, down, then up again, y will go down, up, then down again, while x goes down and then up. So we're not gonna get a different circle, but we are describing a different path. We're still starting at one zero, because cosine of zero is one, negative sine of zero is still zero. 
But now instead of going once around counterclockwise, we're gonna go once around clockwise. Once again, the X starts off at one, drops down to negative one, comes back up to one. And, but for Y equals negative sine of T, Y starts off at zero, goes down, then up, then down again. So it starts off at zero, down to negative one, up to one, back to zero. Any questions? Yesterday, we saw that we can change the coefficients of cosine and sine to make a larger circle or even an ellipse. So, I usually use A for my amplitude. So I'm going to use two different amplitudes. A1 cosine of T, A2 times sine of T. If A1 and A2 are equal, then we have a circle of radius A1 or A2. If A1 and A2 are not equal, then we get an ellipse. We know we can create an ellipse by making the coefficients not equal. This makes sense if we put them into the, the equation for a circle or an ellipse. Or if we just go x, uh, x squared plus y squared equals one. So if we plug these two uh, coordinates into x squared plus y squared is equal to one, Spelled sign wrong. And so just by plugging these into our equation, x squared plus y squared is equal to one. We see that I forgot the point that I was going to make. I got distracted because I had moved my erasing cloth. Well, I got distracted because it's eight o'clock and I haven't finished my coffee yet. But then I also got distracted because I started moving things around my desk like the erasing cloth. I put it in the wrong spot. I couldn't find it right away. And then that made me think of that scene in Equilibrium after Christian Bale stops taking his meds and he starts rearranging his desks and his partner comes up and is like, oh, dude, what are you doing? And he's like, oh, I'm trying to increase efficiency or optimize. 
And that's going to mess things up. It's like it would be more efficient if all over the world we all drove on the same side of the road, but we don't and we haven't for a long time. So trying to fix it's easier to come up with a solution where the roads just switch sides rather than trying to train everybody that drives on the left to now drive on the right. That would just mess everything up. It would be a disaster. And so that completely derailed me. I'm glad that got recorded. Somewhere along the way, we need to hit up the fact that a, a circle x squared plus y squared is equal to r squared. And in an ellipse, we're essentially dividing by the two radii. And in a sense, a circle is a particular kind of ellipse where a squared or a and b are equal. Because I could divide this the circle by r squared. So in this case, we know how to make this circle. We've seen how to start at, one, uh, start at one zero and go once around clockwise. And we've made it go once around counterclockwise. Let's go after that centered at the origin business. That's also easy to take care of. So we know we can adjust the radius by changing the coefficient in front of the cosine and the sine. If we want to move the center of our circle off of the origin, we can just uh, do a horizontal and a vertical shift. And we know that if we want to do a horizontal or a vertical shift of a function, we just do addition. But since our horizontal is all one function, rather than doing addition before to get a horizontal, we can just, if we do addition after the cosine, that's going to shift things horizontally because cosine is telling us where horizontal stuff is. So if I change, if I just add C1 and C2, if I add some constant terms to my X and Y coordinates, this will shift the center of our circle to C1, C2. So we can see this. Cosine, three sine, okay. So we can see this if we, we can play around with this just by looking at our graphing calculator and adding say uh, one plus three cosine T. And then over here, I'll insert a minus two plus and I'm going to make it a smaller circle because I don't have a lot of real estate to work with. So now we can see the center is at one, negative two. One, negative two. If I change to a negative one, negative two, then that shifts it over to the negative one, negative two.
so we can move the circle around. I can change, and now I move this, the center to negative one, three. And now my radius is gonna be two. If I want to make an ellipse, I can just drop one, change one of these values. I get that tall ellipse. Any questions? I've been using the same direction. If I just change the sign of uh, the sign of the Y, we can make it go around the other direction. So when we're parameterizing curves, we have a lot more freedom in how we describe curves in a plane, and this will translate to freedom in describing curves in space. So that's great. We have more ways to describe a thing. That's awful. We have more ways to describe a thing. So then we have to pick one. Any questions? It is true. Uh, every time I say the phrase in space, in my mind, I hear it as in space. And so every time I say in space, I have to resist the urge to say it in that way, in the long drawn out way. All right, so. So now we have to look at curves in space. I don't necessarily know where that comes from for everybody. I know that the in space thing comes from the Muppet Show with the segment called Pigs in Space. What we're going to do now is add in a third coordinate. And I'm still going to use my cosine and sine. I'm going to drop it back down to the basics. I'm going to go cosine of t on the x, sine of t on the y. And I'm going to start with the one that we were using at the beginning. I'm gonna say Z is equal to zero. This is gonna give me the same circle that we had before, sitting in the XY plane. So with a zero in the Z coordinate, that's just the same circle that we started with. It's a circle sitting in the X, Y plane. If I change the value of Z, I can move the circle up and down, but it'll be parallel to the X, Y plane. So if I adjust this one to, to say cosine of T, sine of T, and then I change my constants to three, Now I've shifted the graph up three units. So the circle is three units above the XY plane and parallel to the XY plane. Now 
It's just taken the previous circle and moved it up three units. Now what we want to do, now what we want to do is trade our constant for some function. I'm going to start with the one that the, the same spiral that all calculus books use first. Uh, change my z coordinate to just be t equal to the parameter. Now we're creating a spiral that starts off in the xy plane, goes around once, and ends at 2 pi above the xy plane. So now we have a spiral. goes around once and moves up like a big circular staircase. And ends two pi above the starting point. We're starting off at one zero zero. And we end at one zero. We're directly above the point we started, but now we're going to be at a height of two pi. That's true. I did not specify T variables. That's why there was such a big pause because it was still loading up the previous circle. This, these first two circles were just going around and it was taking too much processing power in my mind. I had a control C on that one. So there's a picture of a spiral where t is going between zero and that looks like once around is two pi, twice around is four pi, and then it goes almost all the way around again, or it goes at least halfway around. So from somewhere between maybe five pi or so, from zero to five pi. But we're just creating this spiral because the t is just going up. So if we look at, if we imagine, we can imagine looking at this spiral from different locations. So if we're stand, let's suppose that we're standing on the xy plane at the positive x axis. Actually, let's stand on the z-axis and look down at this spiral. If we stand on the z-axis and look down, we're not going to see any, um, we're not going to be able to see the up and down. It's going to be coming straight at us. So 
we're going to see the circle start off at one zero, go around one time, but it's going to be coming straight at us. We're still starting off at one zero. Oops, that's the point one zero zero. It's going around one time, but if we have this top view, we don't see the spiral coming up out of the page. and ending two pi above. So here's a view from the positive Z axis looking down. Let's look from the positive x-axis looking, I guess, backwards. So if we look for, if we stand on the xy plane, so here's gonna be the xy plane. And imagine we're standing at the xy plane and looking towards the origin or standing on the positive x-axis looking towards the origin. So if we're standing here at the x-axis looking towards the origin, then y is gonna be going this way. So we're standing at the positive x-axis looking towards the origin. Then what we're going to see is the spiral start off at one zero zero and then go around one time. So we'll see it rise up and we'll see the Y start off at zero, go up to one, down to negative one, and then back up to one. So we're just going to see the graph of sine. The graph of sine makes an S for sine, and it's still harder to draw this way. So here is the starting point one zero zero. Here is it going around and up. We're not that we're not seeing, and here it ends at one zero two pi. From this view, we're not seeing the forward and backward motion. We're not seeing that this point uh, 100 zero, zero is starting off close to us. This point here in the, um, this point here, where it crosses the z-axis from our view, that point is at negative one, uh, zero and pi. That would be from the top view, over here at negative one, zero, pi. We don't see how this, this pi change, we don't see that this is above where we started. Just like here, this negative one is the part that we can't see. I see that y is zero at these three points, but I don't see this negative one part, that's forward and backwards. Then we can do the same thing from the positive y-axis looking towards the origin. This one's gonna be a little bit weird because of the way that I've chosen to present this. 
but I like it to be a little bit weird. Discomfort is how we know it's working. Let's look at, look at this spiral from the positive, positive y-axis looking towards the origin. So now this, the horizontal is still the xy plane, but now instead of looking at it from the positive x-axis, we're gonna shift over here to the positive y-axis and look towards the origin. Notice that if we're standing at the positive y-axis and looking towards the origin, at the positive direction for x is going to be to our left. So this is usually the thing that people hate the most. This is because we've been conditioned to be, have right be positive and up is positive. We're like, all oh, right is positive and up is positive. Right is positive and up is positive. But here, because of the, our positioning, standing at the positive y-axis, looking towards the origin, left is positive now. Now, when we look at this spiral, we're gonna see the spiral start off. What we're gonna see is we're gonna see the spiral move up, but we're not going to be able to see the forward and backwards motion. We're not gonna be able to see the, the motion in the Y direction, but we will be able to see the motion in the X direction. What's X doing? X is doing cosine stuff and Z is moving up. So what we're gonna see is a cosine where our starting point is still one zero zero. We're still ending at one zero two pi. This point negative one zero pi, now we're going to be able to see that change in the X. So here's where X is negative one, Y is zero. I drew a comma too big. and we're at a height of pi. So here are three different views of this spiral. From a notation standpoint, this all makes sense because we're looking at uh, the graph of y equals, um, we're looking at the graph here where y is equal to the sine of z. And here we're looking at x equals cosine of z. If we take a look at what we have um, with cosine of t, uh, x is cosine of t, y is sine of t, and z is equal to t we can see that we can write uh, these two functions. If X is cosine of T and Z is equal to T, then that means Z is equal to the cosine of, uh, X is equal to the cosine of Z. If Y is equal to T and Z is equal to T, that means that Y is equal to the sine of Z. And so we're getting this sine graph but our input is on this vertical axis and our output is on this horizontal axis. So if we grab our coordinates again, so X is cosine of T, Y is sine of T and Z is equal to T. Since Z is equal to T, if I combine these two together, we can write y is equal to sine of z. And that's exactly what we see in this graph. Just imagine an alternate universe 
where we have y going up and uh, y instead of our outputs being vertical, our outputs are horizontal and our inputs are vertical going up. Any questions? So imagine just adjust your view from positive y this way and positive, uh, positive y is left and positive z is up. Adjust your view to the traditional inputs go on the horizontal and outputs go on the vertical. Just adjust your viewpoints. If we translate the traditional y is equal to sine of z, but change the horizontal and vertical, it's the same graph. It has the same points. We've just changed the it, we've just changed the inputs and the outputs and their direction. Any questions? One of the reasons that we start with functions and just drill functions so hard is that functions is the easiest case. Dealing with uh, curves and representing them as functions gives us something that we can rely on. We just put always put the inputs on the X on the horizontal and the outputs on the vertical. And we make one coordinate be a function of the other coordinate. Now that I'm taking that away, life is, begun, is gonna become more difficult. But that makes sense. We have more freedom to describe things. We have more ways to describe things and that's gonna make things more difficult because not only can we describe more things, we have more ways to do it. Before you only had functions, so life was simple. When you don't have any choices to make, you don't have to make any choices. So we didn't do a lot of examples of curves in space, but we have to start with, so I, what I wanted to do was take something that we know, something that's familiar, this unit circle centered at the origin with a radius of one going once around counterclockwise, starting at one zero zero, or one zero, and then adding some height to it. It's a good exercise to take a, um, to take a curve in space and think about what it will look like in different views. What does it look like from the positive Z look, axis looking towards the origin? How about from the positive x-axis looking towards the origin and the positive y-axis looking toward the origin? What do all those views look like? And then while you're doing that, also think about what parts are we missing? I'm drawing things in two dimensions, a three-dimensional object in two dimensions. What dimension am I missing? What part of the motion am I missing? If you're blindfolded, and you grab the elephant's leg, you get the picture of the elephant, but you're missing something. And if you grab the elephant's tusk, then you get, got a different picture of the elephant. So what part of the elephant is missing? All right, that's gonna do it for today. I'll see y'all on tomorrow. Everybody have a good day and thanks for playing.